Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you guys are doing all right as you lost an hour of sleep. I am grateful for the setup team that had the foresight to realize that this would be an issue, so they brewed like four, four things of coffee instead of the usual three. So feel free to, you know, like during the message, if you need to just get some more coffee, that's fine. Um, so my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Access. Uh, our mission as a church is to be a church seeking to live life with God in soul, community, and mission. And so when we gather here on Sundays, everything that we do is oriented around trying to create a space for people to connect with the living God, connect with one another. Uh, that's not we don't just all stay home and listen to podcasts, right? We, there's that element of community and to connect with God's purposes in the world. All right, that's the mission piece. And um, over, uh, you know, we're in a season of Lent, which uh, we've, Ted introduced a phrase of just making space. And so I, I think that's a really helpful idea just to consider in this season of Lent. We want to try to put a little attention on making a little more space in our very crowded and busy lives to hear God's voice, to hear what he's saying to us even just to know that we're loved. So before we kind of dive into today's talk, I just wanted to give you guys another just space, just a second to breathe in uh, and just to get present to this moment, to what the Spirit might want to say to us this morning uh, and through His Word. So just take a moment to uh, breathe deep, maybe a couple deep breaths. God, I believe you're here. You're with us. Uh, you're always with us. Um, and we are gathered here this morning because we want to know you more. Uh, we want to connect with you, God. And we want to connect with one another. I pray that uh, you would just, out of your love and grace for our community, that you would speak through the words that um, I'll be sharing today. Lord, we love you and we worship you. We submit to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, last Sunday... Ted introduced a new series uh, called Kingdom Hope, uh, and it's a series in which we'll be walking through the book of uh, Luke for the rest of Lent, which really started at the beginning of Ash Wednesday, which was this past week, and goes through Good Friday when Christ is crucified, and then culminates on Easter Sunday when Christ is risen. And you might have noticed on Ash Wednesday this past this past week, you might have noticed some of your coworkers or friends with uh, the ashen marks. Uh, those are the, called that the imposition, the, at, the imposition of ashes on their foreheads. Uh, in the past, Access has uh, actually had a really meaningful uh, Ash Wednesday service to help us in, kind of start this season of Lent. And what typically happens in an Ash Wednesday service, if you've never attended, is that the pastor or priest will stand, um, you know, next to the person receiving the ashes and say. Uh, from dust you came, and to dust you shall return, right? And it's a very, it's a very uh, sombering kind of a sacred moment because you just realize the frailty of human life and human existence. Um, but you have to be careful because it, it's, it's, there's some mistakes that can sometimes happen. And uh, a friend of mine uh, forwarded me this, uh, this, uh, this photo which uh, I thought was, was really hilarious. So I don't know if it's staged or if it's real, but you got to be careful when you, like, you, know, you make these church bulletins, right? So just, just take a look at that for a second. Um, when I saw that, I was like, that is so awesome. <laughs> I, you know, I, don't even know, I don't even care if it's fake. I just think it's so awesome. And I was just like, God, just have mercy on you know, that church secretary. Um, I, you know, I just, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that was like an honest typo, right? Um, so, like, you know, mistakes like this, they happen all the time in church world. Uh, they're really common, and some of them are kind of comical like this. Uh, but other mistakes uh, can be, you know, a lot more serious and have a lot more implications. And this whole series, Kingdom, Hopes, Kingdom Hope, as we walk through the Gospel of Luke, is about um, highly, uh, highlighting what I think is a really important mistake that, that churches have often made. So what am I talking about? Well, what would you say to this question? How would you answer this question? What would you say that most people in the church would say is the central message of Jesus? How would you answer that question? Now, when I was thinking about that for myself, like growing up, uh, well, what's the central message of Jesus? What, what was I taught? 
And as I was reflecting on this question, I realized that it was kind of muddled. Like, it wasn't ever really clearly articulated, hey, this is the central message of Jesus. What was very uh, clear was what was the central message of Christianity. And what I was taught was the central message of Christianity was that, one, you're a sinner. Two, Christ came and died for you and rose again. And three, you got to believe in him in order to have a relationship and go to heaven, you know, and to, to be saved. That was what I was taught was the central message of Christianity. And so by extension, I was kind of like, okay, well, if that's the central message of Christianity, I guess that's the central message of Jesus. But what I want to say today is actually that is a mistake. That is a mistake. For sure, uh, we are sinners. For sure, we must believe in Jesus. For sure, God intends for us to have a relationship with him. Those are all true things. But I want to suggest to you that those are not the central message of Jesus. And it wasn't really until college and after college and then in seminary, as I was just kind of just reading the scriptures and reading the gospels, I was like, oh, actually, I think the central message of Jesus, according to scripture, is, is this, is the kingdom of God. That if you just kind of start reading through the, the gospels particularly, you just start to see that the thing that Jesus was most concerned about, the thing that he proclaimed and was trying to demonstrate to the people was the kingdom of God. This is exactly what we read last week in Luke 4, 43. But he said, I must proclaim the good news, right? The gospel, the good news of what? The kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. Mark chapter 1 says very much the same thing. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So, you know, just to let me put it as clearly as possible, Jesus' central message was the message of the kingdom of God. So why is that important for us? Uh, that's important because to understand who Jesus is and what he's about, we have to understand the kingdom of God. To understand the gospel of Luke, which we're reading as a community right now, we need to understand the kingdom of God. Everything that Jesus teaches and says, everything that he does through his deeds, somehow it's all connected back to the central concept of the kingdom of God. And so last Sunday we read how Jesus enters a synagogue and he makes this it is essentially a kingdom announcement. It says in Luke chapter 4, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, Jesus found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were like fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is like Jesus' mic drop moment, all right? He just, boom. And people are like, oh, what, what just happened? And then Jesus launches into this incredible kingdom tour. He starts going from town to town, and he's preaching, and he's teaching, and he's healing people who have been paralyzed for their whole life. He's giving the, the blind sight. Uh, he's forgiving sins. And in all these words and deeds, Jesus is demonstrating this. He is a he is exhibiting to them, this is the kingdom of God come near through me. Uh, and so it's this amazing, amazing picture. And uh, let's see. So it's as he's doing this, as he's going from town to town, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Oh, this is funny. So full disclosure, I'm missing a page of my, <laughs> my notes here. So this will be really interesting. I'm going to first check to see if it's here. <laughs> All right, 
Holy Spirit will have to work. Okay. All right. So let's see. All right. This is this hasn't happened. This is funny. I was. It's kind of a sad. I was talking to a friend of mine. She's uh, Trisha. Right. We were presenting. I was like, Hey, have you ever like misplaced your notes or whatever? She's like, No, it's never. It's never happened to me. We both agreed that that would be like the worst thing that ever happened. So I guess it's not that bad because I have most of it here. But <laughs> page three, the crucial middle, middle is missing. All right. So. He says to them, uh, today the scripture is fulfilled. And then he launches on this tour, going from town to town, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Um, And as he's doing this, the reaction of the people is varied. Most people, as they see, like, these miraculous healings are just in awe. As they hear him teaching these things about the kingdom of God, it says with authority, they're just like, where did this guy come from? Who is he? And then it says this, all the people were amazed and they said to each other, what words he are, what words these are. With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So most people were just really caught up in what was happening, but not everyone. Not everyone was so impressed. Not everyone was so gung-ho about this Jesus guy. Because as, if you continue to read in Luke 4, in Luke chapter 5, eventually what happens is this group of people called the Pharisees enters the scene. And uh, they're, not, they're not that much into Jesus. They're kind of more like, who, who is this guy? And what's his message about? They're pretty suspicious of him. And Uh, In this particular episode in Luke chapter 5, what happens is uh, Jesus says to this man, uh, be healed. But more than just physically healing him, Jesus goes the extra step and he says to the guy, your sins are forgiven. And again, the Pharisees are scandalized. They're like, who can forgive sins but God? Does this carpenter guy from Nazareth think He's God? Like, what's his deal? And they're they're starting to get really upset by this Jesus. And Jesus tells, uh, yeah, he he interacts with these Pharisees in a way in which, uh, yeah, we kind of have to pay attention to. Um, And so there's another episode. So after he heals this man, Jesus goes and he invites a man named Levi, who is a tax collector, to come hang out with him. Now, Levi uh, is this tax collector, and so what you need to know about tax collectors is they were not liked at all. They were very much despised. Uh, And in fact, you know, you think about like the IRS, right? Like, how many of us enjoy getting letters from the IRS? Uh, Not me, right? I mean, I get nervous when I see those letters, right? And so uh, imagine in this, imagine if you received from the IRS, and it was possible that the agent who gave you the letter also had the authority and the power to not only charge you for what you owed, but could actually put like a four times tax on what you owed and could pocket the difference. And then imagine that the IRS agent not only, not not like didn't work for the United States, but actually worked for a foreign power, right? So now you have this foreign power stealing your money and doing it legally. That's kind of what the, the tax collectors and Levi represented in this culture. And so what Jesus does is he, he invites this guy that was despised and hated, and he invites Levi to follow him. And then there's a scene in chapter 5 where Jesus goes to Levi's house, and they have a banquet. Levi is so excited that Jesus has uh, initiated a relationship. He throws a banquet, and he invites other tax collectors, and he invites other sinners. And they're like, drinking, they're eating, they're like doing karaoke. It's just like they're just like having a great time. And meanwhile, the Pharisees are looking at this and they're like, what? And they say to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do we, but yours just like go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come When the bridegroom will be taken from them, in those days they will fast. And so Jesus tells them, yeah, fasting and prayer, those are important. There's a time for that. But that time is not right now. Because right now is a time for celebration and joy because I am with my disciples. I am with them. I have come 
bringing the kingdom of God. Um, And the other thing you should know is that the Pharisees were kind of known for their fasting and praying, right? So there's this juxtaposition. They were known for their, like, they would make it really obvious that they were fasting. And when they prayed, they would pray these long prayers. And that was kind of their, like, trademark signature move. And so they're kind of like, there's kind of like this contrast. Like, Jesus, you do eating and drinking, and we're, like, all about fasting and praying. What's up, right? Um, And so you can see this conflict is starting to brew, So Jesus knows this, and so he tells them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. In a second, we're going to come back to this parable. That's going to be the focus of today's message. But right after this happens, there's another encounter with the Pharisees that I want you to see. Uh, And so in this occasion, uh, Jesus is on the Sabbath, and there's a man with a shriveled hand. And Jesus says to him, it does, says to the crowd and to the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to do good and to save life? And so he tells the man, hey, reach out your hand, and he, he heals the man on the Sabbath. And then once again, the Pharisees, are, at, at this point, they're just like, we've had it with this guy. He, he's a blasphemer. He's like, uh, he's kind of ruining our, our rituals, and he's breaking the law now, right? And so they, uh, it says in verse 11, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious, and they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, the parable of the wineskins is flanked by two encounters with the Pharisees. That's a really important thing for you to see, to really understand the force of what Jesus is saying. So right before that wineskin parable, we saw an interaction with the Pharisees, not positive. Right after, we see another interaction with the Pharisees, not positive. And so to understand kind of what's happening in this parable, is kind of helpful to look a little bit deeper into who are these Pharisees? What's their deal? All right, so the Pharisees were a sect within re- Jewish religious life. Uh, and they were known, they were actually respected by the people because they were extremely devout. They uh, were devout in their inher- adherence and obedience to the Torah and the inter- interpretation of the Torah. Uh, so they, these were just very pious religious people. Um, and they were known for their fasting, prayer. They were known for their holiness. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a temptation to kind of look at the Pharisees and be like, you know, these guys are just so awful or whatever. But if you actually think about it, they were, they were just trying to obey their faith in a very dedicated and devoted kind of way. They were just very ardent believers. Uh, I, I think about, like, if they were alive today and involved in the church today, I think there's a good chance they would be, like, Sunday school teachers, or they would be teaching our kids. Uh, they'd be leading Bible studies or our life groups. Heck, they might even be up here giving a message, right? They were, they were well-respected within the Jewish community because they knew the law. They knew God's commands, and they really, really tried to follow it to a very strict letter of the law. Uh, and so you might be asking, well, like, why would they be so annoyed with Jesus? Why would they be so, yeah, uh, frustrated by him? The other thing that is important to realize is that so for 400 years, um, this is what's called the period between the Testaments. For 400 years, uh, there was a kind of a drought of God's revelation. If you, if, you know, if you have a Bible, you can see in the table of contents, right? The Old Testament ends with Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They were the last of the prophets, the officially recognized prophets of God who had spoken to the Jewish people. And it was 400 years between the last prophet, Malachi, and then when the events of the New Testament occurred again. And so Protestants have sometimes called this 400 years the 400 years of silence. Because God's revelation wasn't 
coming to the people in a way that it was before. And so the people were just waiting. They were waiting. They were waiting for God's uh, promised kingdom. They were waiting for deliverance. They were waiting for God to do something. But what's really interesting is that during this time of waiting, they got used to the status quo. Uh, if you think about the status quo for a second, is uh, the status quo has this power to sort of lull us into a complacency, doesn't it? It has the power to kind of just get us used to the way things are, even if, those, even if the way things are isn't good. Just by virtue of kind of being used to it, we kind of just accept it as a part of life. And so the Jewish people during this time, they were an occupied nation. They were, they were oppressed, and they were waiting for their deliverance. But what's interesting, you see them, they, they became used to not being delivered. They became used to this kind of drought of God's revelation. And in this spiritual void, this group of Pharisees rose to influence. Because while the people were waiting for God to come, and God wasn't coming, they were waiting, and they got used to it. The Pharisees come in, and they bring this strict observance to the law. They say, if you do this, if you follow all these laws and work really hard to be righteous and right with God, then somehow maybe God will be pleased with us. And even though their laws were like back-breaking, they became familiar. And so the Pharisees created this very tightly knit religious system that people could cling and put their hope in during this time of waiting, right? The laws were never going to save them. But in the meantime, this was just something they could grasp onto. And in this time of waiting, as the Pharisees built this sort of tightly knit religious system, guess who sat on the top of that system? The Pharisees. Right? That was their focus of power. That was where their influence was. And so during this time, they're waiting, and they're, they're getting used to the status quo. And then this guy named Jesus enters the scene. He's this rabble-rouser that starts to disrupt the status quo. And he starts to say things and do things that the people had never seen in their lifetime. That the Pharisees were like, where is this coming from? He was performing these miraculous healings. He was casting out demons. He was forgiving sins. He was teaching with authority. He was reinterpreting their sacred laws and applying them in new ways. And it threatened their status quo. It challenged the systems the institutions, the patterns that they had grown accustomed to. So Jesus knows this is exactly what they're starting to feel. They're starting to feel threatened by Jesus. And so he tells them this parable. No one tears a piece of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. So this parable, some of the metaphors and images merit some explanation. I think the patch one kind of makes sense to us, right? You've ever had the experience, you bought like a pair of pants that fit perfectly and then you put them in the laundry and then they became capris, right? Or like you bought a t-shirt, you're like, this t-shirt looks great and then it becomes a midriff, right? Uh, we kind of know, right? Uh, new clothes, they have to go through the wash first be before they like get to their true size. This wineskin thing is a little bit, you know, maybe it's a little bit removed from us. Uh, you know, I was at a wedding yesterday and there was champagne. There wasn't like a wineskin sitting on like the middle of the table, right? Uh, so what's this deal with wineskins? Well, Back in the day, um, they would create these wine skins made of things like goat skin. And, you know, like leather and other skin materials, they're like, they have a flexibility to it. And so what one would do is you would put wine in it, you would put new wine, and eventually that wine would ferment, right? 
And so the process of fermentation, I mean, there's some interesting things you learn as you research like these sermons, right? Yeast kind of works with the sugars and it, the fermentation process yields ethanol, which is what makes it good wine, right? And it produces carbon dioxide. And so that gas just starts to expand the wineskin. And so as you know, the aging process happens, eventually the wine has undergone its fermentation process and the, the goat skin has, has expanded to the size that it will expand. But if you take new wine and put it in there, right, that new wine hasn't finished fermenting. And so it'll create more carbon dioxide, more gas, and the expansion will continue. But guess what? That old wineskin is at its max. And so what can happen is that wineskin can explode, and then you've, you've lost all your wine. So Jesus is telling the Pharisees, I am the new wine. I have come bringing the kingdom of God through me in a way that maybe you were not expecting, in a way that won't fit into your, your current existing and your old religious systems. It will require something new, something radically different, and they were not ready for it. Jesus came announcing the coming of the kingdom of God, and then he showed them what that kingdom looked like, and it wasn't what they were expecting. It was a kingdom that not only healed people's physical sickness, it reached in deep into their hearts, and it forgave their sins. It gave them wholeness. It was a kingdom that didn't separate who was in and out, right, because you're too much of a sinner. It was a kingdom that welcomed tax collectors and other sinners at the table of fellowship and in community. It was a kingdom that saw the law not as an end unto itself, but as a tutor to the greatest love of, law of all, to love God and to love our neighbor. And so perhaps most importantly, though, it was a kingdom that you didn't enter by being religious or holy or obedient enough, right? Jesus knew that that system will not work. That system is exhausting and it's tiring and it doesn't work because we're broken. Instead, it's a kingdom that you enter with childlike faith. You say, Jesus, I can't do it. Will you come and save me? Do you notice that all the people that respond to Jesus, they're desperate people. They're people who realize, I can't do it on my own. They're battling physical ailments. They are ostracized. They're on the fringes of community. They are desperate. And these are the folks that come to Jesus. They are hungry for something new. Because what is has not been working for them. And so the crux of Jesus' statement for us today is the last verse. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new. For they say... The old is better. Sit with that for a second. What is Jesus saying there? No one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. What Jesus understood was that he was coming. To, he, he came to this earth to offer the world life, to offer the world this new kingdom that would bring wholeness, that would bring hope, uh, that would bring forgiveness of sins, that would give us purpose and meaning. He, I mean, he knew all these good, and, and yet he also knew there will be people who reject this invitation because they would rather hold on to the status quo. Because the status quo, even if it's crappy, even if it's not good, is familiar. It feels safe. Jesus invites us into a real life of love, of just overflowing love. But you know what? That means letting go of our familiar friends of bitterness and resentment. Jesus invites us into a life of courageous faith and mission. But you know what that means? That means stepping out into places that are unknown, stepping out into relationships 
uh, that are unknown and unfamiliar. Jesus invites us to know and be known by the one true living God. But that means letting go of our treasured idols, the ones that we've, we've grown accustomed to holding on to and adoring for, for decades. Jesus invites us to live into passionate freedom, but that means surrendering our addictions. And so the people that realize that, you know what, I need this new thing. The status quo is not working for me. It wasn't people who had it all together. It was people who were desperate and knew it. It wasn't people who had perfect bodies. It was people whose bodies had failed them. It wasn't people who were well-loved and accepted. It was people who were ostracized and on the margins. It wasn't people who were in control of their lives morally or spiritually. It was people tormented by demons, both literal and figurative. These were the people who had tasted the old wine and said, enough, enough, I need the new. And so the question that I think God wants to challenge us with is this, what do you and I truly want? What do we really want at the end of the day? You know, not, do we, not what we say, oh yeah, yeah, I want more of God, but what do you really want? Do you want to stick with what is known and what feels comfortable, even if you know that the current reality is not God's best for you? Do you want to hold on to that? Or are you willing and are you wanting to step into God's best for you, to step into this new kingdom of hope, but realizing it will mean change, it will mean disorientation and disruption. Uh, last Sunday, we did a prayer exercise um, where we started with our hands down, and then um, we moved to hands up. And I wanted to do that same prayer today. I think it's a fitting way to respond to what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and what he is saying to us today. And so my invitation is, is this. I, if, if you feel comfortable, if you want to participate, um, simply put your hands like this. And let this be a sign of releasing, of letting go of the, the old things, the old thought patterns, the old ways, the things that you might be clinging onto for security or for comfort. Let this be releasing the addictions. Let this be releasing the anger, the resentment, the things that have become familiar, the things that have become status quo. Let this be releasing our complacency. So take a moment just to identify what that is and just in a prayer with you and God, just to release what you need to release. And then when you're ready, turn your hands up, your palms up. And let this be a sign of receiving newness of life, of receiving God's hope, God's life, God's forgiveness, God's ways, God's freedom. So take this moment to receive that which you need from God. Lord Jesus, um, today um, I worship you because you are a God who loves us unconditionally. You receive me and you receive everyone here. You receive us just as we are. And God, you are a God who loves us so fiercely, so much, 
that you are willing to disrupt our status quo because you know that we were made for something more than the status quo. You, we were made uh, to pursue life with you, life to the full. And so I pray for us as individuals and as a community, Lord, that you would, that you would change our appetite so that we would long for the new. We would long for you, God, and be willing to surrender and let go of the old. God, may your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite the worship team just to lead us in a response as we, uh, as the